is my distinct honor and pleasure for, in opening our IPEC event series today with, I don't quite know how to introduce you, Ted, an artist, a visionary, a sage, <laughs> a guy whose suitcase is in Chicago and who came here from LA where it is 80 degrees with no coat. And I know Daniel Wozniak can speak to that because she had the same experience. Anyway, I was running around Target this morning finding him gloves, which just shows my <laughs> motherliness. But anyway, so I'm not going to say much about Ted except to say that we met um, in LA a while back. And I walked into his studio and just was overcome with emotion and overcome with the beauty of the narratives that he's going to present to us today about visible, physical scarring, uh, invisible scarring, and um, I don't know, the transformation of life um, through your personal story and the stories of many, many, many people that you have come to know. How's that? Okay. <laughs> This is Ted Meyer. That makes me sound like I actually have some knowledge that I don't have, so. But I'm gonna basically tell you the story of what it is like to be someone with a long-term chronic illness, how I survive with it, how I help other people survive with it. And since you guys are in a number of different disciplines, this slide presentation lends itself to sort of jumping around from subject to subject. So if there's anything that is close to your heart and what you're studying, we can always come back to it afterward. But I'm just going to sort of tell my path and what I've done being somebody with an illness and how I've tried to help the world a little bit along the way. So we'll start with the first picture, and I'm going to do this just because I've never been one of these places that had a laser before. That's me. Um, at the 1964 World's Fair. So I was in a wheelchair a lot as a kid. I was born with Gaucher's disease, which is a genetic illness. It's a very small population, rare disease. It's mostly European Jews. And although it is a genetic mutation that's found all around the world because the ghettoization of Jews, it tended to really explode in the Jewish community of European Jews, not the Sephardic Jews. Um, there's about 6,000 people with this illness. I was diagnosed when I was about five years old. I had severe bone pain, uh, enlarged liver. They didn't know what I had. They thought they were gonna have to amputate my leg. Luckily, there was an intern from Poland at the hospital in New York who said, I, I know what this is. The swelling's going to go away after a while. Don't cut his leg off. So that's why I can walk in here under my own power today without much, without a prosthetic leg. So this is my grandfather. My grandfather was Russian, and that's me. And he's looking at me thinking, my cute little grandchild, and I'm looking out thinking, you have left me with a genetic mess to deal with. And. My parents, my mom was Russian, my grandfather, my dad was Polish. They're right by the border and that's the area where everybody had this disease. It's, I believe it's one out of every uh, 6,000 Jews has it, but there's a lot more carriers. So whenever people intermarry now, they try to do tests for it, but I'm not sorry, not when they intermarry, when two Ashkenazi Jews get married, they try to do tests ahead of time before they have children. Anyway, that's my bloodline, lucky as it was for me. And this is my brothers, uh, Richard on the left, the one who looks like me, Doug, the one on the right that does not look like me. And this is our family. So my parents, both carriers, I don't know if any of you do genetic stuff here. So they're both carriers. My brother Doug, not even affected at all. My brother and I are both uh, 
have the illness, we both have the recessive genes hit us hard, so we both have it. And this is us in a hospital, both having our spleens removed in Mount Sinai Hospital. I believe I was six and Richard was probably 11 at the time. We both had spleens that were enlarged out to about here. We looked like those little Biafran children you would see pictures of. Um, it, it's kind of a dangerous situation because if your spleen is that extended, if someone hits you, it, it'll burst and you could die. What happens with Gaucher's disease, there's an extra cell, plus we're missing an enzyme. So they tend to collect in areas of the bone where there's soft tissue in the long areas of the bone. So you become anemic because there's not much blood being produced in there because fat cells get impacted in there. Plus they're a little bit bigger than regular blood cells. So when they go through capillaries, if there's any kind of trauma to the bone, you get a bone infarction and the bone collapsed. So by the time I was seven years old, I had a lot of bone damage. My brother, on the other hand, even though the same illness had different symptoms, his affected him in the muscles, which landed up being a problem later on. So I spent a good part of my childhood in the hospital. I had constant pain and really severe pain. Imagine your bones are swelling from the inside and cracking because they're getting so big over a two or three week period. It was very, very painful. And I used to just go to the hospital. They would give me enough medicine to put me to sleep for about a week or so. And when I finally started to feel better, I would wake up. So I took a lot of morphine at that point. Uh, and I sort of built a family community in the hospital, which is one reason I do a lot of these talks with hospital people and patients and things. I was, I'm very comfortable in a hospital. Even to this day, if I go visit a friend in a hospital, if there's a gurney out in the hallway, I could probably lie down and fall asleep. It's just, it's like a, a second home for me, not one I want to be in, but I don't have the creepy freak out thing that other people have about going to the hospital. I can go in there, although I still hate the smell of hospitals. So, when you're a little kid and you are sick a lot, you can, you can hate going to the hospital or if you have parents like mine who were very good at convincing me that I really had a pretty normal life as long as I was alive, you learn to take good things from it. First, cake when you get home. So this was me. I, I remember one time being in the hospital until the day before my birthday being out of the hospital on my birthday and having to go back in the next day. This is from that picture. So you get cake. I never had to go to gym class. That was such a blessing. All through, never had to go to gym class. I missed a lot of school. I had a home teacher a lot of the time. And at the time, it seemed like a great thing. I, I sort of wonder at this point whether that's why I have such a short attention span but I never, had, I never really had to go a full year of class. I would miss half the, the year. And back then they would have a tutor come. I guess they still do that. I learned early on about painkillers and I learned very early that I liked drugs a lot. I liked painkillers. So at seven or eight years old, back in the old days, they didn't have the drip thing they have now. They would just come in every four hours and shoot you up with morphine, which as a kid to get that kind of rush was an unbelievable experience. And as a result, I've never done any drugs in my entire life because I have absolutely no willpower. If you put potato chips in my house, I will eat the entire bag. I cannot say no to things. And the rush of that morphine was just so overpowering to me, even at seven and eight years old, so no alcohol, no pot, no anything for me, because I just felt that I would be too weak to say no to all of it. Imagine, if you will, an eight-year-old child sitting in the hospital after three and a half hours after getting a shot, ringing the nurse going, where's my drugs? Where's my morphine? I really was sort of becoming addicted. And something about my system also, I, I build up a tolerance to drugs 
really quickly. So I just knew they'd be very dangerous. Um, the other thing I learned is when you're healthy, enjoy it. I had short periods where I was, I was healthy and I made the best of them. And I also learned there's a lot of people that are much worse off than me and you need to appreciate the fact that you are healthy than them no matter what your situation is. There, there was one story when I was in the hospital. I was probably about eight years old. The nurse comes in to me and says, don't go to the nursery because she described it was a hydrocephalic baby. With, you know, there's a kid in there with a really big head and it'll scare you and don't go in, which I never would have gone anyway because I've never had an affinity to babies and I've never wanted children. But once she told me about this baby with the big head, I had to go see the baby with the big head. So I get in my wheelchair and I roll in and I see the mother singing to this baby with a giant head. And it was one of those points where even at eight years old, I could appreciate the mother was taking everything she could with this baby, even knowing the baby was gonna die in a few days. It was her baby, she was singing to it, she loved it even though it had this gigantic head. And it really made an impression on me that you need to enjoy the few moments you have that you're healthy or you're alive or appreciate the fact that you're in a better situation than other people. And this is me in the hospital. It's one of my favorite pictures from when I was a kid because I'm sitting in the hospital with all my art supplies. And I would always draw in the hospital. Part of that is I just came from a family where there was a lot of art, but there was also Mrs. Katimsky who would come by with her art cart with pipe cleaners and glue and glitter and all these things. And we would do art in the hospital. And she's the one that started me doing artwork about being sick or about my illness or other people's illnesses or just the idea of doing art about something other than drawing a flower or drawing a still life or drawing a landscape. She was very good, even though she wasn't a trained art therapist, at getting me to feel comfortable with being around sick people. And that, that lasts till today. I'm, I still do that sort of work. I did this when I was about 21 years old, 22. I was asked to be in a show about, of self-portraits. And at the time, both my hips had collapsed. I was in a lot of pain. I was doing graphic design, which I hated at the time. It was, this is how old I am compared to all of you. No computers. So when you did graphics, you had to get the type set, you need to cut it out. If there was a typo, you had to cut it out, individual word, put it on straight. There was always the pressure that the little piece of word would fall off and something would go to the printer without a word in it or the word would be crooked and I hated it. I totally hated the pressure. Plus, I was in a lot of pain. So this, is, this was sort of my mental state at the time. But everything I did at that point in my life was based on the fact that I was in a lot of pain. So I know some of you guys are doing social work and some of you are doing patient care. Pain is a, it can be a really strong motivator. I think it helped me do a lot of really great things because I wanted to do everything all my healthy friends could do, but at the same time, mentally, it can really wear on you, this constant being in pain. And I did work about myself for probably the next decade. I did, I did work about hurting. I did work about being depressed that I was hurting. And before I was about to have my hips replaced, I did this series called Structural Abnormalities. And they were all figures that were compressed. The, the bones are sort of weird, distorted shapes. They, all the figures are very isolated. And this was happening because for the, I was about to do my hips. I knew one other person at this point who had had a hip replacement with my illness, and she had a terrible time with it. She almost died. There were all sorts of complications. First of which, they gave her the wrong blood type, which almost killed her. As a result, her immune system was bad. The, the hips got infected. They had to pull the hips out. She landed up in a wheelchair for almost two years. 
And she was the only other living person I knew with this disease. I had grown up with one person with it who ended up dying at about 19. So uh, I was so nervous going to the hospital. I was thinking I could die from this operation. And my whole life up to this point had been, well, you'll probably die in, by the time you're 30 anyway. But here, I had lived a little longer at this point, and I wanted to keep living. So I was very nervous about the operation. It actually, it went pretty well, relatively, although I got a defective hip that never adhered to the bone. I've had, th I've had three hip replacements. Two of them have not gone well. One has gone great. Well, that, we'll talk about that, expectations of operations uh, afterward. So now I'm still doing these. Uh, this one was done for UCLA for their lobby. But now, now I'm healthier, so I can look back on them, and they're not as painful looking. They're a little more fun. There's animals. There's brighter colors and things like that. So first hip at age 34. And it really changed my life. I had gone from being able to not being able to walk. I was using a cane. I was falling down to, to being able to walk. I don't know if you guys are used to looking at x-rays, but you'll see there's a bunch of wire wrapped around the hip. When they put the hip in, uh, they use a mallet. They hammered in. The bone exploded. So they, they wrap bailing wire around your hip, some sort of sterile wire, to hold it together so it could heal. So between the defective hip, which what actually happened is it had a very thin layer of oil on the outside from when they smoothed it that they never cleaned off. So between that and the break, it never had healed and it always hurt. But I was still better off than I was before I wasn't falling down. So these are the first paintings I did after the hip replacement. The one on the left, I was still taking a lot of drugs and I don't remember doing. But I think they're interesting because I've, here I go from those angry images to images that are kind of social. There's full bodies. There's sort of sexual. People are interacting. The color palette is brighter. Everything changed. And it wasn't at all a conscious decision. I just started doing different art because pain was gone. So that's sort of one of those things when you deal with all the people that you're going to deal with. They could be in a really good mood one day because they're not in pain, and they could be in a really bad mood the next day because they're in pain, or they're in a bad mood because they're anticipating there's going to be pain again. So you never know what you're going to deal with when you're dealing with patients, with especially long you guys that deal with long-term pain people or care people. In 1997, they came up with an enzyme replacement for what I have. It was the first replacement, recombinant design drug for someone with an, a problem like mine. And it is an expensive drug. It's $250,000 a year. So all of a sudden, well, let me go back. When I was five years old, I gave the bone marrow to NIH to start doing research. So from the time I was five years old to my late 30s, early 40s, I was always told, one day we're going to come up with this treatment. You might not be alive to deal with it because I'd always been told I would die in my 30s. Luckily, I lived. I outlived them all. I outsmarted them. But... Finally, this drug comes, and there's this huge, huge cost to this drug. And how are you going to pay for it? And how do you justify taking a drug that's $250,000 a year when the average income in the whole country is $46,000 a year or something like that? And five policemen could be paid for that, and six teachers, and you know how many nurses? So there was, a, there was a real guilt factor at the same time as they have now given me a drug and said you can have a normal lifespan to justify to myself the worth of this. Even, and then getting insurance and all sorts of problems like that. But there's a lot of these new drugs that you guys will meet people 
that have drugs for very small, specific populations that are genetically rooted or they are biotech designed drugs for small populations, they're going to be really expensive because now, because of my drug, they have shown that you can make a huge profit off a very small population of people. And it's going to cause a lot of problems for people because it's hard once you've had this drug to then say, well, I'm not going to take it. I'm, you know, what's a mother going to do if her kid has cystic fibrosis and they come up with a new drug, but they say it's a million dollars a year to keep your kid healthy? The mom is going to find some way to come up with that cystic fibrosis drug money, whether it's, you know, haranguing an insurance company, a politician, robbing a bank, I, I don't know. It caused a, all my medical bills when I was growing up caused a lot of problems for my parents because my brother was sick and I was sick. So they had to pay for, for all of that stuff. It led to fights, it led to my mom drinking. So there's ancillary problems when you're, when you're sick that your whole family has to deal with. I also had my hips redone. So the first one got redone and it's now good. The second one gets redone and it's not good. I can't bend it and the doctor uh, did not want to admit that he had not done a good job. I woke up after the operation, the doctor's in the recovery room in his blue space suit. He said, how's your leg? And I said, it's not right. And he said, oh no, it's right in the x-ray. And now it's been 12 years and I know it's not right. He still insists it's right, but I'm in my body and I know that I can't bend down to tie a shoe. I can't run fast. I can't exercise. There's a lot of things I can't do, but to him, it looks right on the x-ray and he's convinced it's fine. So doctors can be really stubborn and sometimes you have to get other opinions. In this case though, is it bad enough that I would do a new hip replacement? I don't, that's a lot to go through again. When I, my first hip replacement I was in for 11 days. This time it was nine days. The technology is so good now, you can be in and out in a day and a half. That's, that's how much things have changed in the last 25 years. So these are the kind of paintings I do now. They are about happy people, and they're really colorful, and they're all interacting, and there's lots of love and animals and things that are not as emotional as before. So this is what happens when you become so content in your life and you have no misery to show your paintings just land up being colorful and happy. This is my, it's, this one's called Adam and Eve and Friends. So this is my brother, the other brother that also has Gaucher's disease, and my cat brothers, Stephen and Stephen. Um, this is just around the time Richard was starting to show symptoms of Parkinson's. So one of the things about my disease, now that people are living longer because they are treated from the main symptoms, they are starting to get secondary symptoms. 16% of people who have my illness also develop Parkinson's-like symptoms. It's not actually Parkinson's disease, so the Parkinson's medicines don't work very well on it. But it, all other ways, it's like Parkinson's. You get the shakes, you lose the ability to speak. So my brother had a very long decline with this drug. And that set up a very weird imbalance in me because my life is getting better. I am on this new medicine. I have my new hips. I'm doing new art. I'm traveling all over the world to exciting places. And his life is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So. There's a lot of guilt in this. If you are the healthy one in the family or the healthier one and somebody else is really sick in the family, especially if it's the same illness. And I know some of you guys do social work. Some of you guys are dealing with patients. It's a big problem. I have another brother who has uh, done a lot of very self-destructive things with his body as far as eating and not taking care. And sometimes I wonder whether that's a result of the fact that Richard and I got a lot of attention by being sick. Doug's the healthy one, yet he seems to have done everything possible to 
hurt his own body. It's, which is very hard for me. I see him and I think, why isn't he healthy? Why isn't he out going to the gym? But, but he's not. Okay, so when you are told at 38 years old or whatever age it was that you were going to have a normal life expectancy, there's a lot of things to deal with. And there's a video I'm going to show where I talk about this. You, everybody thinks it's hard to go from healthy to being sick. But there's also sort of a weird ricochet when you're sick and all of a sudden you're going to be healthy. I did not plan to retire because I didn't think I'd live long enough. My retirement plan was to die in my 30s. So all of a sudden I needed to think, how am I going to survive? I haven't really saved that much money. I spent the younger part of my life working, traveling. I, I would like go to India, I would go to Africa, I'd spend my money, I'd work for a while, sell some paintings, do some graphic design, go travel again. It never occurred to me I had to worry about retiring. Before Obamacare, it was almost impossible to get insurance. A lot of the policies I could get had small caps, like $250,000 a year. So I would hit that cap within a year and I'd be out of insurance again. This is why I'm a big Obamacare supporter, even though I would, I'm sort of socialist in this, I would much rather one, what's it called, single payer, where everybody in the whole country has national health care, but at least I can't get booted off in a policy anymore. Before Obamacare, I was paying almost $4,000 a month for health insurance because the drug cost $250,000. So I got insurance because I had written a children's book. I got in the group policy for the Writers Guild and immediately sent all their premiums up. So another guilt-related thing where I am affecting the people around me negatively because of my sickness, I'm affecting their health policies. So my insurance is now, I have a premium Kaiser policy for $800 a month that even includes dental. And I cannot be kicked off this policy unless we get a Republican president who will, with a Republican Congress, get rid of all that stuff. So I'm hoping that things stay the same and eventually go to single payer. Relationships. When you think you are going to die young, you do not take relationships very seriously. So I tended to run around. I was pretty promiscuous. I, would, I really wanted a relationship because I needed stability in my life because I was a sick individual physically, not mentally, <laughs> but it was very hard to not want to experience everything in life, whether that was traveling or meeting people or sleeping with people. I wanted to do everything I could before I died young. And then all of a sudden, when they say, well, now you're going to be around for a long time, you think, maybe I should get married. Maybe I should have a kid. Maybe I should take some of these people more seriously that I had dated before. So now I'm actually dating somebody I dated 25 years ago when I was not a very good boyfriend, and we've been together about six years. The guilt from taking the really expensive drug. So you've got the, are you worth that much, and, the, and just the cost of it. Getting to realize that there's so many people worse off is something I never thought I would start to see my friends dying before me. It's really interesting. I'm 56, 57 now, 56, 57 next week or next month. It never occurred to me my friends would start dying before me. You know, I would go to, I'm the one that would go to the 30 year old high school reunion and everybody would say, oh, you're still alive. We thought you'd, you had died. We hadn't heard anything from you. And now I'm going and they're, I'm finding out they're died. It never occurred to me I would outlive people. Um, I got to meet John Waters. I don't know if you guys know John Waters, but that's John Waters. We were both wearing red suits at an art opening, so we had our picture taken together. But the stuff I've gotten to experience is pretty amazing, and I never thought any of it would happen. And then once you're given a longer life, what do you do with it? Do you just go to the monster truck rally and drink beer, or do you do something with it? And I decided that I should do something with it. And a lot of that is because I met this girl. I was at an art opening in Los Angeles, and I was speaking to K-12 
Candace Bergen and Henry Winkler. Not that I know celebrities, they were just at the art opening and I was like, I'm talking to Candace Bergen, I was very excited. It was when Murphy Brown was on, which is an old TV show, a lot of you probably don't remember. Anyway, so she's a big TV star at the time. This woman rolls into the art gallery and she's wearing an evening gown that exposed her back. And I was, I was so taken by the fact that she would wear this backless gown into an opening, because back then, it was about 16 years ago, people were still pretty shy about scars. You didn't have guys in the Olympics running with blades on. It was before the Iraq war, so you didn't have all these people with prosthetics. We're very used to seeing prosthetics now, and people walking around with just a metal stick coming out of their leg, but 15, 20 years ago, people were still kind of embarrassed about these things. She was the first person I ever met who was just like, yeah, that's the way it is. My life is still really good. So we landed up having a conversation after the opening. Well, first, I just I walked right toward her and started talking to her. And we had a long conversation afterward about what do you do with your life when your situation changes? She had been a dancer, and she wanted to keep dancing. So she moved to L.A. after her accident, which was... Very simple, she was at a, a summer camp and she was on a zip line and she let go of it and fell 23 feet, landed on her back on a rock. And you can see right in the print where her, where her back broke. So I wanted to do art and about mobility and health because basically she had told me that I should do that and I had been sick of doing all those paintings about love and animals and things that didn't mean anything, so I thought, I have nothing left to say about me. I'm not doing any more work about my illness. So I'm going to start doing work about everybody else's illness around me. And what was interesting is that this opened up a floodgate because so many people want to talk about their illnesses. So I went to her house. I did a print. I rolled ink on her back and I pulled a print. I got this idea because I had done fish prints. I don't know if you've ever seen in Japan, they do prints of fish. They roll ink on a fish and they print it and, and all the scales show up. It's a really ancient sort of art and printmaking. So I had taken a class in this and I thought, well, maybe that'll work on a person. So I did a print of her back and then I detailed it so you could see the print a little bit better. I showed it at an art gallery and people walked into the gallery and they started pulling up their shirt, pulling down their pants, lifting up their dresses, taking off. Everybody wanted to tell me about their scars and their stories and their car accident and their liver transplant, whatever, anything. It was, it was amazing to me because I'd always sold a lot of art, but I'd never had a reaction that all these people had to seeing somebody else's scars. So I just thought maybe I should stick with this for a while. So that was 16 years ago. I've done about 100 of these things now. And I have a list of people this big that want them done. And I always say that it's as if I became the bartender to the scarred. People write me from all over the world. I'll open up my email. There'll be a picture of a, somebody's, like a bloody stump. And they'll say, I was in my little town in Somalia and somebody cut off my wrist because I was the wrong religion thought you'd like to see the scar. Or just amazing stories of survival people sent me. And what I learned is all these people, they are major survivors, even if to you or me it seems like a small incision or something to them, they feel like they survived it, they want to tell the story. And it became really clear that telling the story of people's scars was a big part of their survival and how they dealt with it. So this is a girl who someone introduced us. She had had a tumor on the inside of her pelvis. It didn't show up on x-rays. It didn't, doctor couldn't see it. They kept telling her it was sciatica. She should stop doing yoga. And it kept hurting, it kept getting worse. They sent her for an x-ray. The x-ray didn't show anything. The doctor kept trying to get her insurance company to pay for an MRI, which they did not want to do. So after almost four months, if you see, 
on this print. I did some detailing on it, and there's a calendar there of exactly how many days from the day they requested the MRI to when she finally got the MRI and saw that she had this grapefruit-sized tumor in the back of her pelvis. At that point, the doctor said to her that she was inoperable and she was going to die. And she just, I don't remember the term they gave her, but basically they just said to her, that's it. That's the end of your life. She was 18. So she went and talked to 15 more doctors. And she met one guy who was just out of med school that she said was her doctor house. You guys remember house? You know, he was a pain in the ass, but he always cured everybody. So this guy decided that he could remove half her pelvis, take tissue from her leg, sort of put it here so she wouldn't roll over anymore. And, but to do that, he would have to, she'd have to lose her leg too because without the pelvis, there's nothing for the leg to sit in. So at 18, she loses half her pelvis, her leg, meets a guy in the hospital and takes him to the senior prom. So I love her. She's, she's absolutely one of the most forward-thinking, happy people I know. And she goes out and does a lot of public speaking now to cancer survivors. But here's an example. She knew something was wrong. The insurance company delayed it. Had they not, and the tumor was smaller, they probably could have operated on it and she'd still have a leg. So anyway, I didn't really explain what I do. So I do these prints of everybody and I display them with their stories and I have the print and I try to tell the story of the person and the person also writes a narrative of their story and how they feel when they see the scar. And almost every story they talk about, the strength from the scar, the strength about surviving. So when you guys are dealing with patients, it's really important to let them know that once they get through all the crap, they're probably going to feel much better about themselves and stronger because they've had this really big challenge in their life and they've gotten through it. That's something that doing these scar prints has really proven to me. I only have one person who has said to me their life is worse off afterward and, and they had a, a bad facial scar but, and the marriage broke up and stuff afterward. He blames it on that. I have no idea if that was it or that was just the time the wife left. But now he's just gotten a big job with the LA schools, setting up a whole new section of Latino studies and you know, it hasn't affected him career-wise. But again, most of these people are gonna tell you they, once they came through this, they feel much better about themselves. This guy, fireworks, blew his hand off when he was 19 years old. He thought he was being responsible. All the fireworks went off, one of them didn't. He went over to throw sand on it, and when he shoveled the sand in, enough oxygen got in, the firework blew up right next to him. The scar on his side is because they took his hand and joined it into his stomach for like three months while they figured out how to operate on him. So he was walking around like this for three months. That keeps the blood flow going to the part that needs to be operated on. His family story, and if you come up, is this one of the ones I sent you? I think it is. His story is upstairs. Also, uh, we're having, where are we having a show of these on Thursday? So, Thursday night at what time? Five o'clock. Come up. I've got, I think, about 20 of these, and uh, the stories are there. Anyway, his story is that his mom had an accident in Germany when she was a kid and they developed this technique of keeping the hand in on his mom 30 or 40 years before. I have no idea if it's true, but that's the story he tells, so I, uh, that's the story I tell. And this is my cat. And my cat was obsessive compulsive and used to scratch her head so badly that she would rip her head open so the people who had her before me declawed her. The claws got infected, so then the feet had to be removed. And then they didn't want her. And they left her at the vet. And I saw her in the vet sliding all around and thought, I'm the scar guy, and I should have this cat because I'm the guy who can relate to the, the sick cat. The reason the cat is in the collection when all the other ones are human 
is because of the reaction you guys just had. You're shaking your head, you were like, oh, everybody, everybody feels sympathy for the cat, yet you just saw a girl who had to have her pelvis and leg taken off. But when the cat shows up, everybody's like, oh, the poor cat. Poor, <laughs> poor cat's got it really rough. That cat had a great life. I made a ramp for that cat so it could go up the steps. That cat was the king of my house, the queen, it was a girl. But it makes you wonder what it is about us as people that we can see the cat and go, oh, this poor cat. Whereas you can see the guy who blew his hand off and go, stupid idiot, blew his hand off. And when you guys are dealing with patients, you have to remember this compassion you feel for the cat and try to have that to people. I don't know what it is about when you're dealing with people. Maybe it's if we really felt the compassion to people that we feel toward the cat, you'd be immobilized. You know, if every time a patient came to you, you were like, oh, you blew your hand off. Oh, that's so sad, you know. But we don't do that. And if any of you have been to like a third world country, you've been to India or somewhere like that where there are people with all sorts of malformations growing on them and scars and amputations, after about 24 or 48 hours, you're walking around there and you can really block that stuff out, but you see the dog walking down the street with mange or you see an elephant going down the street with a cut on its leg, you know, in the middle of some city in India. You're like, oh, poor elephant, the poor cat, the poor dog with mange, I mean. So there's something about us where we are really able to put a wall up when we're dealing with people that I don't really get, even as somebody who is really empathetic and tries to be compassionate with people. I, like I said, I uh, grew up around hospitals. I was around a lot of sick people. But I'm the same way. I see the cat and I'm, I still, I miss this cat. The cat died about six months ago. You know, I miss the cat. But the guy that blew his hand off went through a lot more than this cat did, you know. So remember that when you're dealing with your patients. So my brother, my brother's deterioration. So this is him in 1994. It was a cover of an album. He was a folk singer. And this is about two years before he died in a nursing home. So again, I don't know exactly what uh, specialties you guys are all going into, but if you're helping people with patients, especially if they are in nursing homes, the one thing I learned is that you really need to advocate for them. I was in California, he was in New York, and I would go back about every two months and I always found things at the nursing home. His clothes weren't being cleaned. They were throw them in the floor on the closet rather than hang them up. You know, you'd get him, you'd, I'd send things for him, foods he liked, they weren't being fed to him, you know. You, you have to advocate for people. So when you're dealing with families of care, families who are caregivers or people in nursing homes or institutions, they, someone needs to advocate for them or they're going to be forgotten even though you're paying for them to have care. And that's really what I learned from him. The other thing, the, around the same time my mom landed up getting breast cancer. And my mom had been a caregiver her whole life. Her mom had had a brain tumor when she was a kid. Then my brother and I were born sick. They came up with this new medication for us. Uh, we felt better, my dad started to get dementia, he dies, then my brother gets Parkinson's. So almost her entire life she was a caregiver. and She didn't really know much of anything else, which very much affected our relationships. Uh, she, she was very uncomfortable when I was finally healthy. She didn't know how to relate to me as a healthy person. And as Richard got sicker, she took more and more care of him. Right at the end, when she was very sick, the last few days of her life, I knew that her main concern, well, this, this will tell you how much she cared about him. She goes to the hospital to have an aspiration done. She had fluid around her lungs. During that procedure, she had some kind of stroke or something. We're not really sure. They put her in an MRI. She wakes up in the MRI. She's not able to speak, but she comes out and she's writing all everything that we should do for her funeral, where all the things are she's, that she's lent to people, who's got her toaster, who's got my great aunt's quilt, all these things, she's still smart enough to do that. 
But rather than go to a hospice, she decides to go to the nursing home where my brother is because she wants to be around him the last couple of days of her life. And it was not a nice nursing home. So I go to the nursing home. My mom, the first day I'm there, she can still see me. She's very alert. She can write. The second day, she's sort of out of it. And by the third day, she's really struggling to breathe. And I just sat down next to her and because I knew her only concern was my brother. And I said, do not worry, I will take care of Richard, he will be fine. She took one more breath and died. So you have to let people go. Tell, your, tell the families you deal with, this thing of keeping people alive for every possible second. The people don't always want to stay, they just, at least in this experience and from other people that I've heard, People want to go, they don't want to struggle. They just want to know that they're leaving everything okay. And as soon as she knew that I would take care of him, it, it's not an exaggeration. She took one breath and went, oh, that was it. My, my sister-in-law always likes to tell, introduce me to her friends as, this is Ted, he killed his mom. So, <laughs> it's not true, but. So the next, once I started doing the SCAR series, and people were coming to me about this, I decided, I started hearing all their stories about things doctors did right and wrong over the years. So I decided that I wanted to try to bring artwork into a medical school so I could have some effect on the doctors who are gonna be treating all of us later on. So I approached UCLA about being the artist for the medical school, to which they responded, we don't, we're not an art school, we don't need a doc, an artist, and I kept calling them back for like six months because I kept getting the receptionist, and the receptionist kept saying, why don't you call the art department? So finally one day, she was sick, I got the assistant to the dean of education, and within 45 minutes of explaining to him what I wanted to do, the dean of education called me back. So they gave me the gallery, the lobby of the UCLA Medical School to turn into a gallery and I bring in artists to show work and give a talk to the doctors. And all the artists have illnesses and they do artwork specifically about their illnesses. And by, my hope is that by explaining what their art to the doctors, the doctors get a better insight in their lives. So let's go through some of these. The top right, this woman had MS. So, for 24 years, she kept all the bottles that her MS medicine came in. All the IVs, all the sharps containers, everything. And she makes these gigantic installations out of all these, although she did get clean sharps containers because one museum didn't want her showing stuff with blood in it. Um, but she takes all these saline and medical bottles and makes them into these amazing patterns. This is one of a series of patterns from all these bottles. And her feeling is, if she can at least control what happens to the trash generated from her illness, all the bottles and the medical supplies, she has some control over the illness. Uh, the, the one on the bottom left is a woman who took photos of her mom going through dementia over several year period until her mom died. And most of the photos are her taking her mom to lunch at McDonald's because she found there was something about the fast food thing that her mom could still relate to. And she would, you know, it was such a simple process. You go, you order the hamburger, you sit down, that even toward the end she could do that with her mom. So most of the photos are about her mom eating fast food. The one on the bottom right is about uh, a friend who had had a mastectomy, and then they called her back to say the cancer was back. And this is her depiction of the call when the doctor said You've got, the cancer's back again. Top right is a portrait from a show of adults with developmental disabilities. The woman who did this can't even speak, but she did this portrait of herself. The diagonal ones are a guy who has cystic fibrosis. He's, I think he's 36 now still alive, which is sort of unusual for cystic fibrosis. But he does performance art about his illness and he does artwork. So the top photo is him in an area of LA where there's a lot of galleries. 
bringing his machine that, I, I don't know what it's called, but it cleans out your lungs. It sends oxygen and other drugs to clear the gunk out of his lungs. So he does these sessions in public at gallery openings so that people will ask him what's going on and he can talk about organ donation and things like that to try to get more people. He's on a waiting list now. And being on a waiting list is really difficult because the sicker you are, the higher you go up on the waiting list. So if you want to have a good quality of life and get healthy in the meantime, he go, even with, I think he's got like 18% lung capacity, he goes to the gym. It really, it is embarrassing when you see a guy with, in, with a respirator in the gym working out, doing better than you. So he does these performances. Anyway, so he's in a position now where he was very sick and he was high up on the list, but since he almost died and didn't get lung shed, he started doing everything he could to get healthier, so now he goes down on the list. So it's a really, the organ transplant thing is, it's mentally really taxing. And then the bottom right, he, if you have cystic fibrosis, they send you to the hospital every once in a while to do sort of a lung tune-up, try to clear your lungs out as much as they can. And he does artwork in the hospital about being in the hospital. And I love this photo because whenever I've been in the hospital and people bring you flowers, you have nowhere to put the flowers, so you inevitably use your pitcher that they give you for water for the flowers. So to me, this is like the most telling. As soon as I saw this picture, I knew like, oh, this is it. This is the hospital experience. So he, whatever artwork he does during that week, he's in the hospital. The last night he's in the hospital, he has an art opening in his hospital room. And he puts up all the art that he's done in the hospital that week. The one on the bottom left is by a woman who had really severe migraines and back pain. So she did these sculptures using wire and sponges and this rubber brain. NPR did a story on this show and we brought one of the doctors in from UCLA to talk about the artwork in the show because it was all artwork about back pain. And his response looking at this was not about the wire sticking out, the tightness of it. He just said, well, proportionally, it's not right. And that's the problem you have dealing with doctors is they tend to be a lot of times, I mean, there's a lot of good doctors, so I'm not casting this over everybody, but he, he looked at it, oh, it's not proportionally right. He, he did not pick up any of her suffering from this piece of art, and I think it's a pretty strong piece of art. So doctors, not the best sense of humor. <laughs> Years ago, I, I shoved a piece of glass through my hand, and I went to the, the emergency room, and I said, the doctor pulled it out and he said, can you move it? And I said, like a chimpanzee. And I thought that was a really funny comment. And he said, you know, they, don't, they can't move their hand like this. And I was like, <laughs> I said, I know, it's a joke. And he goes, oh, okay. So doctors are very weird. I had a doctor once switch my hospital room in one hospital, one side of the hospital to the other side of the hospital because he thought I would prefer the view overlooking the golf course of the hospital, even though I don't play golf, but he plays golf every day. So he moved me, I, had to, I just had a hip replace, and they had to pick me up, move me to this other hospital room so he could get a better view of the golf course. That's all I have to say, and I'll tell you my, okay. <laughs> While I'm on this, this is, this is a thing that, okay. That doctor has gone to Palm Springs to play golf, and on the weekend, they gave me another doctor who comes in on Saturday, and he said, how are you? I said, I'm fine. He goes, did the doctor call you? Because the doctor was supposed to call, check in. And uh, he said, did he say anything? And I said, yeah, he shot a three under. And he just looked at me. He did not see any sense of humor in this at all. And I said, it's a joke. He, he said, how's your leg? And he goes, oh, because you know he likes golf. And I said, okay. And then the next weekend, the same doctor, because this is when it took nine days, he comes in and he goes, oh, I'm surprised to still see you here. What did the doctor say about you leaving? And I said, he said he has three more boat payments. And he goes, I didn't know he had a boat. And he walked out. 
So this is, my brother finally dies of the Parkinson's, and it was, it was a really slow, long process. It was 12 years. And during that period, he lost his ability to speak, which for someone who was a musician is terrible. He lost his ability to walk. We had really no communication, even though I would go and sit there. And you know, with Parkinson's, there's a good chance his brain was still completely functioning inside and he just couldn't get it out. So it was, it was a really, really tough thing. And it was very hard to be the healthy one at that point. So even though I was going back and trying to help, you know, you can't look at that without thinking, what's the genetic twist that he fell apart and I haven't? So, you know, at night when you, you're about to fall asleep and you get that jerk or you wake up and there's a twitch, every time that happens, I'm like, oh my God, it's starting. You know, it's, so I've gone through all these years of you're going to have a long life expectancy and now I'm fine, I'm not going to die young, I'm almost 60, but now I've got this other thing weighing over me that I have to worry about. Hopefully it won't happen, but, you know, who knows? There's always, there's always something. And that's us. So I'm going to show you a video about the SCAR thing, the SCAR project that was done for public broadcasting. The guy who is in this video is the most amazing guy, and it's why... I like being around sick people <laughs> because when you listen to this guy and everything he went through and at the end he's, of telling his story, he's like, I would do this again. I wouldn't change anything in my life. And he almost got killed in Iraq and he had 42 operations. And this is really typical of people that once they make it through, they're much stronger. So let me, this will take a second to set up. day it was a regular patrol just sweeping sweeping the supply route sweeping the city and um, we encountered this ID and before EOD even got there is when the uh, suicide bomber came in and attacked my vehicle that is unlike any scar I've ever done before yeah Close to how your leg looked right after the explosion. Yeah, I actually got some. My doctor's giving me some some pictures of that. Like it was completely open. Ugh. For me, the scars, they're stories. Everybody has their story. So the the scar represents the absolute second where someone's life changed. From that point on, their life is different, how they look at themselves is different, and sometimes how people look at them is different. I just grew up without mother and father and was raised with different relatives, and by the time I was 15, I was living on my own. I knew I wasn't going to college, so uh, senior year, I just started looking at different branches of the, of the military. and. Army was the one that kind of spoke out to me. Plus, I always love to travel and I want to see the world. The one thing that I've really found is that you're born, you've got your body, and then depending on what happens to it, that's, that's your challenge. And some people, whether they have a hip replacement or colon reconstruction or a heart transplant, Everybody has their challenge, and the scar represents what could be the biggest challenge of their life. So, I, I love the stories. What's happened to me is it's, it's become much more about the storytelling to me than the actual art. Once I got out of the hospital, I, um, dude, I just went 
rock bottom. Like I went straight into depression because I was confined to that wheelchair. When I was about five or six years old, I started having really severe bone pain and was diagnosed as having Gaucher's disease, which is an enzyme deficiency. At the time, there were only about 250 known cases of this illness. There were people with the illness that weren't living very long at that time. I only knew one other person with it, and she died at about 19 or 20. So I sort of have always had this view of making good use of your time, doing things that were fun and important, and, uh, and doing art. I've always done art. So how many operations total did you have? Uh, about 42. Crap. That includes my arm, my eye, my ear, so. I had been doing artwork about my condition for a long time. It was about how I was sort of stuck in this body that didn't work. I had a lot of bone pain, I had a lot of fatigue. It was a, it was a very constant thing. And at, when I was about 33, I had my joints replaced and there was a new drug invented. And the drug completely changed my life. It took away the fatigue, it took away the, the possible death from the illness. It, it basically just gave me a very normal life, you know, considering. Everyone thinks that if you go from being sick to healthy, that that's an easy transition. And in respect to the other one, it is, but there's still a lot of adjustment to be made. Just because physically I had a little bit easier time now that the core of my artwork was still based on mobility issues and health. Because I thought, well, if I have nothing to say about my health right now, I'm going to do work about other people. What I found is usually people have gone through the process of healing and they're ready to let someone see it or touch it or, or make an impression of it. It's something that doesn't usually happen early on. And I've had a number of people who no one has even touched their scar until I roll ink on it. They, people might see it, but they don't want people actually touching it. I mean, today, you know, I can embrace it, you know. I just, it's been, you know, almost 10 years since, it, uh, since my incident happened. So I've gone through all different types of stages. I mean, in the beginning, I didn't want to even look at them, at my scars, you know, I just, I was embarrassed of them. I always wore long sleeve clothing and pants. Um, but today, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's who I am. So, I don't know, if I didn't have this, I don't know who I'd be today. So, I like the person I am today, you know. I do it all over again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it back. You know, the people that I've met throughout my life and, even having my kids since me being out, out of the military, you know. I'd do it all over again. So, in closing, and again, since I know you guys have a lot of different specialties around here, Two things, just remember everybody you're dealing with, they all have their challenge and you can deal with 20 people who have had the same procedure. They might have all had a hip replacement, they might have all had you know, heart transplant, whatever, but depending on their family relationship going into it, how they feel about being in pain, how they feel about having someone care for them, whether they're stubborn and they want to do it themselves, even if they've all had the same procedure, they're gonna be affected by it differently. So that's really important. And also remember when you're dealing with patients, that when you're dealing with a patient, 
there's the whole family dynamic involved in who wants to be the caregiver, who doesn't want to be a caregiver, who did show up at the hospital, who didn't show up at the hospital. You know, there's all these side things that your illness affects everybody around you, or in the case of the people you guys are dealing with, if you're dealing with a patient, you're going to have to deal with their crazy mother or their crazy son who, or the person who thinks they know more because they looked on the internet and you're not doing it exactly like their website that they found on the internet tells them you should be doing it. So all that stuff's out there. So good luck to you all. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. cat, remember, think about the cat. <laughs> Try to be as compassionate to your people as you would be to the cat. Okay. Shelly, any questions, comments before we... Oh, there's... See you again. I'll see you tomorrow. I have something for you. I, I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I said thank you. Oh, sure. uh, a retired Navy SEAL. I work with UNE. I've been with them sort of a project for the last two and a half years. Uh, I'll see you again tomorrow. I have Great. something for you. Great. We can't. Um, I sometimes can't. And what I have for you is, uh, an, is an expression of what I cannot convey to people, but the image conveys it uh, because it's, it's locked up here. And I live with it privately and I scream, um, but I can't explain that in words because no one's gonna really catch, understand that. What you do gives it in another form, another dimension, another way of understanding it. And I so much appreciate what you do, um, and particularly for that veteran because I'm a veteran. So thank you, and I'll see you again. Great. Yeah, come, come uh, tomorrow. It's interesting. There's a bunch of other projects that deal with scars. Most of them are women, and there's one guy who have done these projects of, about mastectomies, and there's lots of images of women now saying, this is what I look like without a shirt on after a mastectomy, and they show a lot of the, the damage to the body. And it's a, that's a really valid project. But for me, that's not what I wanted. And that's why I have the people with the ink on them. I want you to know where the scar is on the body, but I don't think you really have to see all the damage to the body to be able to empathize with the person and know what they, they went through. And as I was saying in the video, to me, that scar marks when their life changed. And it's all about what they did from that point on. You know, I don't... So all the, they're all different artistic interpretations, and they're all kind of getting at the same thing. But you know, everyone knows if you, you know, the guy gets his, some of the, your vet guys step on a landmine or someone has a mastectomy, there's a lot of damage to the body. I, I much prefer to tell the survival story afterward. When I first started the story, I just, this thing, I just showed the prints. And then people really wanted to know the story. So I had the stories, and then they wanted to know who the person was. So it, over about the first three years I did the, the project, it expanded to show everything. So, Ted, I was wondering, um, earlier today you talked about the work you do with kids yeah. and art. And I, it would be nice to, for the audience to hear a little bit about um, what kids need. OK. so. I'm not an art therapist, so I have absolutely no justification that anything I'm saying is true, but I will tell you my experience. From being a kid who was sick, whose parents, I think, did a, a very good job of 
treating me like I was normal even though I was in the hospital. I really have come to believe if you treat kids like they're not sick and this is just their situation and it's different, they're gonna be okay with their illnesses. So I do a lot of work with burn kids. I worked at Shriners for a while, Shriners Hospital with all these really severely burned kids. And what would happen is they would come in and they would be so burned faces, fingers burned off. You know, I don't know if you've been around burn kids, but or burned anybody, but the first thing that goes is the fingers because they're the thinnest and they burn off. So you'd get kids coming in with no fingers and their faces have pressure masks on them because their faces are burned. And as soon as you put a crayon in their hands, you know, they might have to hold it like this because they've got no fingers, and they start drawing. They start humming and singing just like, you know, a regular non-burned child. And, you know, as long as my, that's one thing my parents did. They, they were very good at just saying, yeah, you're on crutches, buck up, <laughs> you're fine. And it, it was never really talked about. And one thing we talked about later is my mom had a very hard time when I was older letting me be healthy. Once I had the new joints and once I started doing all the things I wanted, traveling around the world and going and doing all these exciting things, she was the one that kept saying, maybe you should stay home, maybe you should protect yourself, maybe you should, you know, and I really just wanted to experience everything. So I don't know if you want to talk about this since you did earlier, but it's very hard for someone that's been your caregiver to let you be healthy once you're healthy. You can come up here and there's always another. I just wanted to give him the mummy's point of view, which is you know, you have a, you raise a child who's been ill most of their life, you become their veneer in some ways. I mean, your parents did a great job, but the parent never sort of loses that sense of protectiveness and worry, you know? I mean, you can modify it, you can cope, you can change, but there's this piece of you're healthy for now, but. And I think that, that it's a very, you said that one of the things you wanted are our students and, and, and other visitors here to remember is that the illness is really hard, but the family dynamic is, is really the complicated variable in all of this. And so as you wanted to grow and change and be healthy and be out there in the world, your mother wanted the same thing, but, but she has that piece of the day the diagnosis was made. And that is in her, that's in her body. That, that is an invisible scar. And we, we talked a little bit about that, that, that once you get to a certain age and you can step back from it, you can appreciate the give and take of, of the kinds of things that take place. And you know, there's a beauty of what you've done that is about post-traumatic growth, that's about realizing life, that's about making you know, the positive, but there, there are, um, there's residues, and I think for, for um, some parents, it's really hard to ever give up that sense of overprotectiveness. Um, so it was just a nice yeah, discussion and we had. I was going to say, too, like we have, I don't know if they all know what happened with your son, but her son lost a leg. So, but, in, but it's still a different case where it was my mom where it was a genetic illness. So my mom gave it to me, so to speak. And I think she really had a hard time with that, although it was never an issue for me. You know, Because back then, first of all, nobody knew. There was no genetic testing. Nobody had heard of this disease. There were a couple hundred cases. Even now, there's only 6,000 known cases. You know, so you know, the chances of getting it, nobody knew. And you know, we can look back on my family tree. And you know, my grandparents, a lot of their siblings died young, but back then everybody died. You know, it was not unusual for, to have a five-year-old die. So who knows if they died from bad hygiene or, or something back then in Brooklyn or whether you know, they had gauche, you, you never know. But I think for my mom it was very hard. My dad, not at all. He never felt any guilt from it, you know, but my mom, I think she had a hard Daddy time. told you about yeah, well, it could be. Sorry. 
sorry, I'm really emotional, but I just wanted to say thank you for reminding us. I think we just get caught up in school, but thank you for reminding us why we go into medicine. And really, you guys are the front line because you're dealing with the patients more. The doctors come in and they go out. And I think the much harder thing is to be a nurse or a social worker because you have to deal with all the fallout. You know, you see the doc, my hip replacement, I saw the doctor the day of the operation and one follow up. And he hasn't had to deal with any of the last, you know, 15 years of the fact that he did a bad job on it, you know. So you guys. It's like the nurses that have to clean the bedpans. They're the ones down in the, you know, the trenches, so. All right, well, thanks for coming. And come to the, see the original pieces. You can go to my website, which is tedmeyer.com. If uh, all the SCAR stuff is up there and my other work. And also, if you want to see the work that I show at UCLA of the other artists that deal with their illnesses, it's the Learning Resource Center at UCLA. So if you type in LRC Gallery, Learning Resource Center Gallery, UCLA, there's a web page in it. We have work by all the artists we've shown at UCLA and their statements about why they do the work, especially the woman with the MS and the guy was uh, cystic fibrosis. They're, it's pretty amazing work. It's worth seeing. Go at it. Have fun. Don't get burned out by all the sick people.